Thank you. All right, so again, you need to be able to distinguish between what are expected changes because obviously COPD patients don't have the same anatomy and physiology as we do anymore. So they have natural changes because either owing to chronic bronchitis and or emphysema. I discussed the right side heart failure that occurs, right? With long-standing COPD. What do you call that right-sided heart failure again, resulting from this pulmonary hypertension condition? Core pulmonary. Core pulmonary. Uh, let's go to labs. The common understanding is that COPD patients have chronically high CO2. That doesn't apply to everyone though. Most of them do, but there are COPD patients who are not CO2 retainers. Uh, stated here, not all COPD patients are CO2 retainers. Uh, this is the rationale because CO2 diffuses more easily because it's lighter actually than uh, oxygen because um, it has carbon with it. Um, also the same reason as you know how you can um, you can fart when you're in the pool right but you can't fart into the pool Shidemi, recall the last time you farted when you're in the pool. Can you do that? I, I don't think so. <laughs> You've never farted while you're in the pool? I can't remember. I think maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but I is it know. possible? Yeah, of course it's possible. Okay, so that's the reason. So CO, CO2 or, or any gas can still escape through during gas exchange. So it's because of the alveolar wall uh, changes though, especially in emphysema, oxygen diffusion is harder, but however, CO2 can still escape. Oxygen just can't come in. Other laboratory changes, as I mentioned last week, is polycythemia. This is a compensatory increase. So the body is trying to increase oxygen delivery instead of increasing gas exchange. So obviously, it's, it's a, an, an, um, you can say, a um, desperate attempt by the body in order to increase oxygen delivery. So instead of having, uh, if we can't g get good gas exchange, maybe we can increase the delivery voice. So red blood cells are the ones who deliver oxygen. So uh, by compensating, it's a hope to increase oxygen delivery. Chest X-ray again will show the hyperinflated lungs and the viral chest, as well as a flattened diaphragm. So these are all the changes in COPD patients. There are several stages here. Table 30-2 gives you the gold classification of COPD severity. Of all the testing that's done, uh, pulmonary function test is your standard for staging COPD. The test is not done in a hospital unless the doctor's office is in a is in uh, the clinic, the hot doctor's clinic is in the hospital. This is usually done during uh, times when the patient is well, meaning when a patient is admitted for a COPD exacerbation or a flare-up, we can't do this test because when you, when you do it, then you're doing it on a sick COPD patient. So we want to do the testing when they are doing well. I'm not saying they don't have COPD because COPD is chronic, but we want to do the testing as a baseline when they are not having a flare-up. So they come in, uh, a, the machine is called a spirometer. It's not the same incentive spirometer that you have at the bedside because that's very tiny. A spirometer used for pulmonary function testing is a large machine. 
it's about at least the size of a portable air conditioner and it has hoses uh, at least two hoses coming out of it so the patient is asked to perform a series of breathing uh, most of them involve blowing into the tube one of the most important measurements is called feb1 so this is forced expiratory volume in one second so the patient will be doing this four or five times uh, of course they rest up in between and then the doctor will record the highest reading so the the maximum volume that they can forcefully blow into the tube in one second will be the measure of the severity of their lung. So in mild, they are still capable of meeting 80%. Look at the strength of the lung because basically when you blow, what is it measuring? Is it only measuring the lung or your respiratory muscle, which is the diaphragm? The diaphragm too the diaphragm. So it's measuring how good or how bad are, is your diaphragm, okay? And then, of course, if, if, uh, if the diaphragm is weak, that means the lungs are also hyperinflated, so it's, it will directly measure as well how good or bad your lung is. How much can you forcefully expel in one second? Usually, when it's below 30%, these patients are already bed bound. Uh, you can also compare this to heart failure classification. If you remember class one, two, three, and four. So this would correspond with that as well. So gold uh, or mild level, I would say these patients can function fine. Uh, generally no symptoms when they perform ADLs because they are still about at 80%. However, when they go to moderate, which is now between 50 and 79%, of course, they will have symptoms now with, um, with activity. And then severe, um, there will, of course, be now um, severe symptoms with less than ordinary physical activity. And then very severe, even at rest, these patients are just gasping for air. Most people with very severe COPD already live with um, CPAP or BiPAP nonstop, meaning they only take off the CPAP and BiPAP when they are eating. And even with that, it's a chore. Um, eating, even eating would be extremely difficult for them because you know, they have, they're constantly gasping for, for air and so they have to just chew their food in between breaths. Okay, that's how far uh, their lives are. My father had, um, he smoked for, uh, he died when he was 81. And I heard because I was already, uh, he was already 60 when I was in first grade. So I didn't get to know him that much. I just, and he already had his first stroke at that age. So all I saw was that he was suffering the whole time I was growing up. He died when I was a, a junior in college. Um, but I can see all the, uh, whatever my textbook says on COPD. I mean, he had it. Um, the, the increased secretions, the, the non-stop um, uh, from early morning to late at night, you know, just constantly uh, expectorating the, the thick uh, sputum. And he always had, uh, he had frequent infections as well, gets pneumonia uh, every now and then. And he had multiple strokes on top of that. So he had severe cardiovascular uh, problems. So most likely when you have, when you deal with a COPD patient, you're also dealing with a heart failure patient. Obviously, even if the problem is only smoking, you see that the patient has core pulmonale, which is what my father had as well. There are many other measurements done during a pulmonary function test, but again, the main 
indicator of the severity is the FAV1. So when you read doctor's notes, every time you get report, for instance, you're researching your patient, you always read the medical plan of care. In the progress notes, if it's a COPD patient, you'll constantly be reading about FAV1 because that's the main thing which will predict their uh, prognosis. It's, it's really on um, how good or how bad is the, expert, uh, is the force expiratory volume. Of course, these patients will have a high residual volume. So this one will be high because of the emphysematous changes, the barrel chest. Now the lungs are hyperinflated, so that will increase residual volume with each breath. They cannot completely exhale the last gas that they um, they did that they um, inhaled during the previous breath, and that just keeps piling up um, over time. It's like breathing through a very long snorkel. For those who have uh, who snorkels here. Or, or have, have ever snorkeled? I've snorkeled before. I have. All right, so how long can you snorkel? Can you do it for hours without taking it off and taking a breath? No. No. No, right? Because the snorkel is long, and that means with every breath, you are actually rebreathing some of the CO2, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so and that's the reason why you have to take a break. You have to take it off. Uh, rest up, take a few breaths, and then go again. So imagine doing that for the rest of your life. So COPD patients pretty much are breathing through a very long snorkel okay, for, the, for the rest of their life. So plenty of dead space, plenty of um, breathing your CO2 back in. Okay, Of course, this one again is um, over time. Interventions. I introduced you to the interventions in pneumonia as well as TB. Um, it won't change in, in COPD. So the, your usual interventions, which is oxygen, humidification, bronchodilators, steroids, antibiotics, if indicated, uh, suctioning, um, hydration, uh, postural drainage, it's also the same because this is still a respiratory patient. So your interventions will be the same. I uh, would like to review instead because here, these are all your nursing interventions, breathing techniques. We already discussed them all under uh, in uh, pneumonia as well as in TB. Um, probably this one, I don't remember talking about a vibratory positive pressure device. All it is is a small, um, this, it's, it's usually shaped like a pipe. Um, although some models are not pipe, it's just uh, like a long whistle. Um, the objective of this instrument is to cause vibrations onto the patient's chest. So imagine, um, breathing through a very large whistle. Now a whistle has a plastic or a metal ball inside it, right? That causes it to vibrate and then causing the whistling sound. Okay, so imagine a, big, a bigger device like that. It has a bigger metal ball, of course, and if you breathe through it, it will cause the metal ball inside to vibrate so the device vibrates and the vibration is passed on from your mouth down your throat and down to your chest. So this will help loosen secretions. It's very difficult for these patients to expectorate the thick tenacious sputum. So this device actually helped them do that. Because remember, when we do hydration and then this patient happens to have poor pulmonale, that won't be beneficial for them. So some of these patients may be on fluid restriction because chances are they have advanced heart failure as well because of the COPD. So instead of hydration, we will do the uh, humidification instead plus this vibratory pressure device. 
So they take this home with them. They can use it anytime they want. It, uh, this respiratory therapist hand them out like candy. Uh, of course, the patient is charged for these things. Uh, they just don't know it. <clears throat> but um, just like an incentive spirometer, some patients lose them. And even at discharge, they just leave it at the hospital uh, not thinking. You know that they really they paid for these things. All right. Before I go to the um, interventions, which again we, we did already previously, but um, we'll discuss them again. I'll go back to asthma. Now, asthma and COPD have similar medications. In fact, asthma used to be classified as a COPD disease um, until maybe around in the late 1990s when they reclassified asthma and put it under uh, allergic disorders. But you, this author still put asthma obviously under respiratory. But most other textbooks, they have asthma under hypersensitivity um, chapter. Uh, in fact, whoever is asthmatic here, do you see a pulmonologist or an allergist who are asthmatics here? Allergist, right? No? Pulmonologist, I guess. I don't know. Allergist. Either or, but... Um, I used to see an allergist when I used to have asthma. Okay. Um, Wait, so which one was it? Uh, um, it? It really varies, but for my children, because they have asthma, they actually see an allergist. Yeah, because it can trigger it, right? Yeah, because asthma is triggered by a uh, substance, you know, that they're hypersensitive to. So it really makes sense that you see an allergist. Um, have you reached this part already in pharmacology? Have you finished um, respiratory medications? Yes? Hello? Yeah, I think we did. Okay, so all right. Yes, okay. we did. Yeah. All right, so this should be easier then. All right, chart 30-6. These are, I know it says asthma, but these are also indicated exactly the same as in COPD patients. So the mainstay of treatment are bronchodilators. We have two, we have SABAS and we have LABAS. This is, an, again, another drug chart. So therefore, the testable part is the nursing responsibilities. Always column two. The uh, nurse, or uh, otherwise called the nursing implications. So, bronchodilators such as um, levalbuterol or albuterol, uh, these are called um, beta 2 agonists, right? So, when, when it says that, what have we learned in um, uh, pharmacology? What does beta 2 agonist mean? So same as a, if you compare this to a beta blocker, so this is now the opposite. So if you have beta blocker, which will block the adrenergic symptoms, what will a beta 2 agonist do? It's not activated. A, all right. So therefore, it promotes the action of epinephrine, right? So therefore, epinephrine will cause vasoconstriction. However, by vasoconstricting, it will actually open the airway. So it works like this. If you have, because remember your bronchial tree, your airway is a smooth muscle. And all muscles have so this is, let's say, I cut off. Uh, Christopher's um, neck okay so I cut his head off and then I'm looking down his neck so mm -hmm. on, I'm on looking down his um, main stem bronchus okay. so since this is a smooth muscle there are capillaries there are arteries and veins here 
right, to supply this smooth muscle. So this muscle is able to dilate and constrict. So a constricted um, bronchus would, would be like this, and then a dilated mainstem bronchus would be like this. Okay, and this, this is normal. And this is dilated, this is constricted. All right, so it's all about these muscles here. So if you dilate the um, blood vessels, then that will increase the size of the wall, but you will therefore constrict the lumen. So this lumen now gets smaller if, it's, um, if, it, if you have vasodilation. However, if you have vasoconstriction, which is now here, if you constrict the blood vessels, it will actually widen your uh, airway. The diameter of your airway widens. So that's why when you have an allergy, for instance, like asthma, or if you have a more severe reaction, perhaps uh, anaphylaxis. So with anaphylaxis, you have a severe inflammation causing widespread vasodilation. So therefore, when you, all your vessels are dilating, that will therefore constrict your bronchus. So it's wrong to say, oh, this is actually, this, it's wrong to say that when you have uh, anaphylaxis, that, oh, that's uh, vasoconstriction. No, there's, there's vasodilation there. But because of vasodilation, there is bronchoconstriction. Make sense? Can you explain that one more time real quick? Okay, so uh, your, your bronchus is a muscle. Okay, so this is your bronchus. It is a smooth muscle. I should really learn to write better. Okay, so this is your uh, um, main stem bronchus. So it's a muscle, it's a smooth muscle. Any muscle has vessels in it. So in order for this muscle to contract, or to dilate and constrict, the vessels have to do that. So for instance, let's say, let, let's put, um, uh, let's say Viagra. Viagra is a phosphodiesterase drug. It's a vasodilator. That's why the warning on um, TV is, do not take Viagra. If you, if you take nitrates for chest pain, as it may cause a sudden drop in blood pressure, right? So because if you take Viagra, which is a vasodilator, and you take nitro or nitrates, which are also vasodilators, so you'll have massive vasodilation. So how does the penis get really enlarged and erected with Viagra? It's the really it, right, the vasodilation. So Consider this. So if you're taking a drug, or let's say you're having a reaction, okay, you have an allergy to something. Allergies always allergic reactions always involve heat, inflammation, right? Redness. So why do you look like that? I had an allergic reaction one time. I don't know to what because I've never been allergic to anything. Uh, anyway, my mouth and my nose grew probably four times its size. So I looked like a frog and it scared me because I've never had any reaction to anything and I didn't eat anything new that day. Um, you know, the usual meal uh, that I take you know, as a, a Filipino, you know, Filipino dishes, uh, no problem. No, I, I had that reaction. I don't know what again. Um, so, so the increase in your lips, your mouth, and then at that time my tongue as well, so why did they grow big? Did my vessels dilate or yeah. did they constrict? They dilated. dilated. So the vessels here in your mainstem bronchus dilate. Therefore, they increase blood flow. They increase in size. They increase in diameter. Therefore, it will thicken uh, the bronchial wall. By right. thickening or uh, inflaming the, or pretty much vasodilating all the vessels here, it will increase the diameter of the wall. However, that will leave the lumen of the bronchus now constricted. 
Okay. So yeah, so they're completely separate. So this is here, this is vasodilation. However, it leads to bronchoconstriction. And okay. this one here, you have your, so your beta 2 agonist here, so your Saba, promotes the action of epinephrine or fight or flight hormones. So therefore, you'll have massive vasoconstriction here, dilating the bronchus. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's go back here. So therefore, when you um, see an exam, that's the effect of your Saba. That's why what is a common side effect of uh, Sabas, like levalbuterol or albuterol? What does this say? Tachycardia. All right, so does that, um, does that uh, promote or inhibit the effects of epinephrine? Inhibits mm. or promotes. Promote. Okay, promotes, right? So therefore, mm -hmm. that's what beta-2 agonists do. So they, they promote the effects of epinephrine. Any question on that? Okay, so again, it's a drug chart. Always read nursing implications. So um, be prepared to answer questions on what to teach the patient, how the drug works, and how to use it. Uh, this is a general rule. Uh, most patients aren't following these. And in fact, one of the common reasons, you wouldn't believe it, for um, repeated hospitalizations is that the patients are not using their inhalers correctly. Um, we'll review how to use that because maybe some of us don't know how to do it. One rule is this. When you're taking these drugs, there should be five minutes before you take another drug because most people take it one after the other. Therefore, um, they're not absorbed correctly because your mucous membranes can only absorb so much drugs at one time. So if you flood it, just like eye drops, for instance, when you give eye drops, you should wait between drops because if you put two or more drops at one time in the eye, can the eye absorb all that fluid? No. Nope. Yeah, it's not even actually the eyeball, it's the lower conjunctival sac. Okay, so if you pull down your cheek, that's where you put your eye drops, correct? So if you put too many eye drops in there, just like a, uh, an inhaler, so if you put more than one drop, that conjunctival sac can only absorb about one drop at a time. So you have to wait time between eye drops, or in this case, time between inhalers um, um, before you, you administer another one, all right? We'll review MDI and DPIU shortly. Next group of drugs are LAVAs. These are your maintenance drugs. Do not use them during uh, an acute attack. You'll die if you reach for this because this will not work. Onset of action is slow, slow with a, but they have long duration. So they're better used to prevent an asthma attack or a COPD exacerbation rather than control an acute episode. Again, uh, here's another one. Do not use it as a reliever drug. It's not a reliever drug. Most common is salmenerol, although, although nowadays we have several now. Uh, coming out, um, they have slightly different, the dispensers, I mean, they, because each of these drugs have a unique uh, way to dispense them. Uh, they're mostly dry powders. Uh, when we talk about LABAs, they're usually dry powder inhalers. Uh, our SABAs are coming, uh, they're wet. They are uh, meter dose inhalers, so they have a propellant. Uh, however, most of your lavas are in a powder form, so you have to suck 
the powder in as deeply as possible into your lungs. Uh, not through your nose, okay? It's not, you're not like snorting this stuff. So you just breathe it in, you suck the powder in uh, as deep as you can. Will it go into your lungs? Yes, most of it will. Uh, will some of it go into your stomach? Yes, also. But um, as long as you breathe it in deeply, um, as long as you get some, if not all, into your lungs, then you've taken the medication. We have more lavas, epitropium. Uh, they can be separate, like epitropium and teotropium, but they can also be in the same uh, combination drug, uh, depending on what you um, and what the doctor prescribes. But anyway, um, yeah, epitropium, if used alone, this one is a uh, emergency drug. Um, theotropium, uh, these are your teachings. This is in a um, um, meter dose. Um, this is a common complaint. It causes dry mouth. Um, and these are indications because these are, again, taken uh, during um, emergency episodes. Uh, you tend to use them frequently and these are what you teach the patient that if they have these symptoms then that means they've probably taken too much of the drug. They can also come in uh, nebulizer so they can come in an MDI or in a nebulizer treatment. We have inhaled corticosteroids in the form of fluticasone. Fluticasone can be an MDI um, they do not cause bronchodilation, all right? They only do what? They increase gas exchange by decreasing the inflammatory response in the mucous membranes, okay? Um, please don't think that they are bronchodilators, okay? These are your bronchodilators here, Saba, Lava. The um, anti-inflammatory specifically, these ones do not cause bronchodilation. Just like any other maintenance medication, especially corticosteroids, they should not be abruptly um, stopped. What's the effect? You abruptly stop a steroid again. What did you learn in pharmacology? What is a serious uh, life-threatening complication if you stop a steroid abruptly? what crisis will occur. Who is your... Can you ask my type? Instructor? Uh, not really. I will report you to your pharmacology instructor. And tell the instructor to you very difficult questions. Okay, so this will lead to acute adrenal crisis. Um, the symptoms are, there are three, so you'll have hypotension, severe hypotension, you'll have uh, salt, sugar, sex hormones, salt, salt, yeah, so you'll have hyperkalemia and then you'll have hypoglycemia all right so all of those three are life-threatening correct and if your blood pressure drops will you die yes yep if you if your potassium levels go very high will you die mm -hmm. if your blood sugar drops very low will you die yes okay imagine three life-threatening life-threatening conditions occurring at the same time that is the effect of abruptly stopping a steroid so when you're using a steroid for a long time teach your patient is really important not to stop them abruptly they should always be tapered correct yep one more thing 
is uh, because they're steroids, they tend to cause anti-inflammation effects locally in the mouth in this case because you're inhaling them. So you should, they should do mouth care and then check their mouth for thrush and any other fungal infections which typically grow because you're on steroids. Because remember, our mouth isn't the cleanest part of our body. Uh, okay, so please do read the rest, okay? Um, during an exacerbation, the patient, both with asthma and or COPD, will be put on oral steroids as well. Uh, obviously, this will uh, be your mandrel dose pack. I mean, uh, you guys have taken um, steroid um, packs before, right? Med um, mandrel, you, you've taken them. So they taper, correct? Typically uh, a week or maybe two weeks worth of uh, steroid therapy. Uh, again, these are your teachings for the patient. I'm not testing this because they are not really commonly used. Okay, so uh, we skip hormones, and we'll uh, so in chart thirty dash six is this six? Yes, uh, you do everything except chromones. Okay, uh, not this one. Okay, and then finally Monte Lucas. This is a pill. Usual dose is ten milligrams for adults, five milligrams for children. Uh, this one's specific. Unlike steroids, which which act like a shotgun, which have uh, a broad anti-inflammatory effect, leukotriene modifiers target only leukotrienes. So it's very specific to the um, leukotriene is a cytokine. It's an inflammatory substance that uh, causes inflammation, which is responsible for the symptoms in asthma and COPD. So this one is very specific, so it has less side effects compared to steroids. This is a maintenance drug though. Take it every single day, even with no symptoms. And um, the only bad thing about this is it does cause suicidal ideation, uh, especially in children. And, but otherwise, it's a very good drug. Let's go now to how to use the inhalers. You can use chart 37 and then just read it, or you can watch videos on YouTube. The recommended technique is using it with a spacer. Uh, or if you don't like a spacer, you can use it without one. With, um, without a spacer though, it is acceptable to keep the mouthpiece one to two inches away from your mouth, meaning you don't have to put it in your mouth. However, uh, most people uh, put it between the, the mouthpiece between the teeth and then close their mouth over it and, and breathe. Um, however, it, it is acceptable to put it one to two inches away from your mouth because it does have a pellet, propellant because this is an MDI. You know what an MDI is, right? No. The meter goes in the other? Yeah, okay, that's fine. We, we, uh, Oh, no, I'm asking. Yeah, meter dose in here. The video I recommend is this one. If you watch this and then follow the steps on chart 30-7, um, this will follow the steps uh, almost to the T. Remove the cap from the inhaler. Shake the inhaler well for five seconds. So this technique is uh, without a spacer. Hold the inhaler firmly by placing your index finger on top of the canister and thumb on the bottom of the mouthpiece. Sit up straight or stand up. The 
tilt your head back slightly. Exhale away from the inhaler. Put the inhaler in your mouth. Press the inhaler and start breathing in at the same time. Take a slow and deep breath. Or you can put it as the chart said, you can also hold it an inch or two away from your mouth and then just keep your mouth open. Hold your breath for 10 seconds. Exhale slowly through your mouth or nose. Repeat two to eight steps after 30 seconds if another dose is required. If you are using a cord... Okay, and this one is the one with the spacer, which is the best. And I recommend this video. Remove the cap from the inhaler. You recognize the faces of the chicks, right? For most videos? Remove the cap from the spacer. Okay, this brand is called an Aero Chamber. Very popular. Uh, there are different brands. But Shake the inhaler well for five use seconds. The Aero Chamber. Insert the inhaler into the open end of the chamber. Ensure that the inhaler fits properly. Sit up straight or stand up. Tilt your head back slightly. Before starting to inhale, breathe out completely away from the spacer. Place the mouthpiece between your teeth and seal your lips tightly around it. Press the inhaler once, and then breathe in steadily and deeply. So this is ideal for patients who have very poor dexterity, that they can't time when exactly Hold to, your breath for 10 seconds. Uh, when to inhale, right after they press the, on the canister, you know, they have poor timing. So this one here, the medication circulates inside the chamber and they can take their time. So it circulates in there up to five seconds. So they can slowly take their breath, take their time, no need to hurry, no need to rush. So perfect for small children and the uh, older adults. Or as long as you are comfortable and breathe out slowly. All right, since in both instances we put the mouthpiece in, in the mouth, so therefore there's saliva in it, so at least once a day they should be uh, washed. Uh, here, at least once a day, clean the plastic case of the mouthpiece of both the, um, if you're using a spacer, wash the spacer. Uh, if you don't, then wash the mouthpiece. You can take off the canister. Uh, if you're ordered to receive two pups, then wait one minute. Again, the same concept, the same reason with the eye drops um, that we dis uh, I described earlier. Okay, so there should be a, um, a gap between pups so you can get more of the medication. You paid for each uh, pup, so don't waste those uh, medications. Now let's do a dry powder. So dry powders, the, the dispensers do not have a propellant. It's not like a uh, air freshener.
wherein you uh, press on the uh, button and then it's braced and it doesn't work like that. So you have to um, suck in the powder, right? With each dispenser, with each drug, they have a way of loading. They have, um, they have different um, buttons that you slide in order to open the capsules that are inside. They're usually this shape though. For this one, I recommend this one. So this is all, if you notice, I use the same uh, company to, for demonstrations because so far they're the um, closest ones that I see that are um, compatible with with the with the chart chart 30-7 and chart 30-8 check the dose counter to see the number of doses remaining so the one in they're, they're demonstrating here this is similar to Advair which is the real one is colored purple um, there are other brands like I said but all of them have a way of somehow opening the mouthpiece and then uh, opening a, uh, a capsule inside because this thing here, the disc is filled with capsules all around and every time you trigger this cup, it will open a capsule. So once the capsule containing the powder is open, you, that's what you suck in. And this is handy because they have dose counters, just like your MDI, so you know exactly how many sprays, how many puffs you have left. That way you never run out of the medications. Hold the inhaler properly in both the hands. Open the inhaler by using the thumb grip slide. You'll hear a click. Hold the inhaler horizontally for loading the dose slide the lever from left to right. Now, once you've already loaded the dose, that means one capsule is already open here. So the, the this turn, when you, when you slide, when you slid this to the right and you hear the click, the this turn and open a capsule right in front of the mouthpiece. So now there's an open capsule there. So therefore, at this point, you should hold it horizontal because if you tip this toward the floor, it will drop the powder. So now you're inhaling nothing. So um, after um, activating the, uh, the trigger, then uh, hold it flat. You'll hear a click. Exhale away from the inhaler. Okay, this is very important. You really don't need to do this with the MDI because it's wet and it has a propellant. This one though is powder. So if you breathe in front of the disc, then moisture from your mouth goes into the powder and then it clumps up. Now you can't um, suck it out anymore because it's now wet. Or maybe if you suck it in, it comes out as a solid ball. Now you're gonna choke on the powder. Place the mouthpiece in your mouth. Take a quick and deep breath. Hold your breath for 10 seconds. Exhale slowly through your mouth or nose. Uh, some patients, to make sure they really got it, they'll do it a second time. No, not, not loading another dose, but the same dose that they opened, just to make sure they got it all in. Uh, that's also acceptable. But if you did it right the first time, then there's no need to do that. And as with, uh, especially if the drug, the powder that you're inhaling is a steroid, then don't forget to um, do mouth care, okay? Um, and unlike the uh, dry powder inhale, I mean the MDI, which is again wet, that one you can wash the mouthpiece. This one you cannot wash 
the, the disc because it's powder, so it will put moisture into the, the device. So do not wash it and do not shake it. That's about it. So here again, the, just remember that the drug has no propellant. And you have to actually suck the powder in as deep as you can, as fast as you can. That way you can get it as deep into your lung as possible. Um, one um, advice they give is if you taste the, the medicine in your, in your mouth, that means where did the medication go? Because it's powder. So if you can taste it. In your mouth? Yes, the drug is in your mouth instead of in your lungs. So you didn't suck it in deep enough. You sucked in very weak. You did it poorly. So therefore, the medication never made lung. It's in your mouth. <clears throat> which of course is now useless because it's supposed to go into your lung and it's supposed to be absorbed in your lung, not in your mouth. Um, that's about it. So let's go back to... Uh, yeah, I'm not testing uh, asthma because um, although there are adults with asthma, but uh, this should be discussed only in teens because that's where the, the disorder begins. So I leave asthma with teens. Um, so I'll just stick with a COPD. Already in cystic fibrosis. I'm not doing cystic fibrosis either. That would, should be a, a pediatric topic because those patients do not grow old. I mean, you've seen the movies, right? Uh, what was that movie? Six Feet Apart? Did you guys watch that? That little... Yeah. Year? Yeah, that teenage movie. Okay, so those patients don't grow old. The only, I've only seen one old patient who was 29 with cystic fibrosis, um, but that patient was also already in, in her deathbed. Uh, she was pretty much uh, terminal. Um, she was already on a, on a ventilator, very skinny, very thin, uh, emaciated, pressure ulcers everywhere. Um, yeah, because that's have you discussed cystic fibrosis already in teens? Yes, we did. Okay, so you understand, right? I mean, they have these mucus um, all over the place from the respiratory tract and GI tract, right? Mm hmm yep. Okay, we were here. So monitoring, uh, okay, let's go to breathing techniques. This one, I forgot to mention this last week under pneumonia and COPD, I mean, uh, and TB. So for breathing techniques, uh, the most popular one here is the first lip breathing. Um, this one is more for advanced COPD patients, meaning their the diaphragms are so weak that Instead, we will now use their abdominal muscles in order to breathe because it's stronger, uh, obviously, than their uh, diaphragm at, at that particular point. First, the breathing helps them exhale more CO2 because when you do first lip, uh, if you follow this, uh, breathe in slowly through your mouth without puffing your cheeks and then spend at least twice the amount of time it took you to breathe in. So this one therefore extends the uh, exhalation stage of ventilation uh, longer. That way when you exhale longer, you're in turn therefore ex uh, exhaling more CO2. I hear this all the time in the hospital. They use the, um, the phrase, um, smell the flowers and blow the candles. So you breathe in through your mouth, I mean through your nose and then exhale through your mouth, which is what, um, what this is telling you. Okay, so close your mouth, breathe in through your nose and then purse your lips and breathe through your mouth like you're literally blowing your candles. Uh, 
we do positioning uh, good lung down again did i mention good lung down last week i don't remember uh, uh, probably not uh, anyway for copd both lungs are bad so um they're really good lung down wouldn't apply but it will apply for pneumonia and tb because uh, pneumonia or tb may involve one lung worse than the other uh, coughing is uh, encouraged so we do turning coughing deep breathing and oxygen what did you learn in uh, fundamentals about oxygen therapy for copd patients anybody um that you shouldn't over oxygenate them because uh, okay. i guess get rid of the stimulus to breed i think okay very good um the theory uh again i'd like to emphasize that this is a theory okay uh theoretically speaking yes uh, it will suppress the um the respiratory drive because these patients uh, theoretically have high co2 levels so therefore they are not sensitive to high co2 levels anymore because they're so used to it. So therefore their drive to breathe uh, is now the low oxygen. So it's now the opposite. Unlike you and me, our drive to breathe is really the um, high levels of CO2. For instance, uh, after an hour or and a half uh, listening to me because of my voice, you know, some of you are already yawning, right? Um, so I, I have the effect of maybe 10 milligrams value um, I'm sure you've done that when you listen to recordings, right? It, it helps you fall asleep. Am I correct? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Yeah. So uh, you're welcome. Now, we, um, so listening to me, you're not conscious, but your, your respiratory rate actually drops. So when your respiratory rate drops, that means you're not taking in, it, in enough oxygen, so your CO2 levels rise. And your body corrects that by starting a yawn. You, 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 bring, you, 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 um, you take a really deep yawn, so that involves a really deep breath, right? A long, deep breath. So that, therefore, is proof that it stimulates your breathing, starting with a yawn. Now, in COPD patients, because their CO2 levels are high already anyway. So therefore, it, they will only respond to low levels of oxygen. So again, the theory is, if you give them too much oxygen, therefore there will no longer be a stimulant for breathing. So therefore they could stop breathing altogether. Again, this is only a theory. Uh, thank you for reading this, Ms. Bolgar. Okay. In the past, the patient with COPD was thought to be at risk for extreme hypoventilation with oxygen therapy because of a decreased drive to breathe as blood oxygen levels rose. However, this concern has not been shown to be evidence-based as has been responsible for ineffective management of hypoxia in patients with COPD. All hypoxic patients, even those with COPD and hyper hypercarbia, should receive oxygen therapy at rates appropriate to reduce hypoxia and bring CPO2 levels between 88% and 92%. Thank you. So this, don't interpret this to mean in any way that you can now indiscriminately give oxygen to COPD patients. This just says that if your, patient, if your COPD patient does not meet 88% or between 88 and 92%, do you stop at two liters or four liters? Do you stop there? No. 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 Your goal is still 88 and 92%. So you can safely give oxygen as long as, of course, you have an order. Right? You have an order for oxygen. So let's say the doctor orders, okay, give oxygen and titrate to, uh, to keep the patient between 88 and 92%. So therefore, you give as much oxygen as is needed in order to reach 88% or better. Is that understood? Yes. Okay. 
and with any other medication, uh, include, which includes oxygen, you do not leave them there forever. Meaning you constantly, we, we always constantly try to wean patients off oxygen. If they don't need it anymore, then why continue giving it? Okay, so periodically every shift, you try to dial down the oxygen to see how they do at that level. So if you meet the uh, minimum oxygen saturation with less oxygen, then do so. All right, so I, uh, we always follow the principle of ALARA. A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, which is uh, as low as reasonably achievable. So if you meet uh, oxygen goals, ALARA, then do that. Drug therapy, we already did uh, earlier. So chart 30-6 is your th drug therapy. I won't test this part anymore. Uh, we go on to our interventions, non-pharmacologic interventions. So besides the oxygen, turning, coughing, deep breathing, um, we also have exercise, exercise conditioning. Now, of course, we do not do this during the acute episode. If the patient has uh, an admission uh, diagnosis of COPD exacerbation, that's no time to do exercise. As they get better though, then we do exercise conditioning. So walking would be great. Um, in fact, that's the um, most recommended. So the simplest plan, simplest plan is walking, and then just gradually increase your, their their uh, tolerance. Okay, twenty minutes of walking, and then keep increasing as tolerated. And suctioning, it should only be this rule applies. Okay. Um, for now, next semester, fifth semester, forever. Suctioning should only be done as needed. We'll discuss indications for suctioning. Um, well, here are some of the indications. Weak cough, weak pulmonary muscles, inability to expectorate. Uh, you will have more indications for suctioning in a patient now with an artificial airway. So that's a different chapter. But for patients with no art artificial airways, then these are your indications for suctioning. Um, these are the effects of suctioning. So they're not all easy peasy. Okay? Uh, suctioning is harmful. So that's why we only do it if absolutely needed. Do not routinely suction your patients. These are, again, your um, complications. Uh, hydration, again, unless there is a heart problem, um, then at least they should be uh, on two liters a day. Again, unless they're on uh, usually a thousand um, milliliter fluid restriction in the case of heart failure. This is the vibratory positive expiratory pressure device I mentioned. So uh, as I described, it looks like a whistle, but there's a metal ball inside here, which will cause the vibration and help loosen the secretions as the vibrations are passed on to the patient's chest. We will not do surgical management. This is surgical management of the COPD patient, meaning which is lung transplantation. The patient's lungs are gone. They're, uh, they're lobular, they have bullae. So they're pretty much just occupying space. In um, an alternative to lung transplantation is to remove uh, a lobe or two lobes. Okay, so if uh, the patient's lung, let's say the lower lobe, both lower lobes are pretty much gone. So, uh, but the other, the remaining lobes are fine. So they'll just take out the diseased lobe and then allow the remaining lobes to expand. And that will actually be um, improve their, uh, their uh, breathing. Okay. So either lung transplantation or lobectomies. Um, but again, I'm not um, testing this. So uh, we can skip the surgery part. So I'll only be testing the this um, drug therapy and then the non-pharmacologic interventions. Other interventions are with nutrition. You'll see COPD patients are skinny, 
just like cystic fibrosis patients because they have no time to eat, especially if they're having a, uh, in the winter time when they have frequent exacerbations, it's extremely hard to breathe. So therefore they won't have time to eat. That's why if you notice in the hospital, when, if you've ever been in, uh, into clinical uh, in before March this year, uh, or in the nursing home perhaps, when, when are the nebulizer treatments scheduled? What time? Have you noticed it on the mark? When do they give the treatments? What time? Is the question, Professor? In the morning. In the morning. The yeah. treatments. When do you notice them scheduled on the mark? In the morning. In the morning and the breakfast. afternoon. Yeah. Three I'm times asking. a day. Breakfast, lunch, yeah. and supper, isn't it? Yeah, so I'm asking about the time. So it's about, oh. before, right? Before meals, correct? Oh, yeah. yeah. 6 a.m., yeah, 6 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m., etc. So why is it given before a meal? It's, um, causes a relax the patient. Yeah, relax. This is now the reason. So they have meal related dyspnea, meaning eating is a chore for them. Okay, yeah. It takes a lot of energy to eat, uh, to chew, so therefore they could get short of breath during eating. So therefore to help them out, to maximize energy or breathing before eating, so they give them the nebulizer treatments. And the diet given to them, because we don't really know how much uh, of the meal they can finish or when they can um, eat well again. So therefore, their meals have to be high protein, high calorie. That way, they can, um, even if they eat less, you know, it's nutrient dense. Um, we try, though, to avoid gas forming foods, because uh, that will just get them bloated and, um, you know, they'll, they'll even have um, a worse time breathing because their stomach is so distended. Um, malnutrition will just exacerbate the condition because now they're even weaker um, then you know breathing will be um, worse uh, so these are your management uh, especially with meals okay so follow this uh, teaching so question goes how do you promote nutrition in a patient with COPD these are your choices so um, small frequent meals compared to three large ones okay um, all right so that's where you find your uh, actually not it's not just that paragraph there it's all over this section yeah, I can see the answers here all righty um, anxiety and dyspnea is a vicious cycle have you ever noticed that when you're short of breath, you get scared? Who has uh, ever had a near drowning experience here? Yes. Yeah. So you remember that time. I had one too when I was four or five. Anyway, I was a tiny little boy. They, somebody left me in a rubber tube. And the problem was I was... Um, I was... Uh, caught inside the tube with, with my head down and I couldn't pull myself up so my head was underwater but I was inside the tube so everybody thought I was fine because I was in the tube but then they never noticed that my head was um, you know I, I was too small for the tube let's put it that way that it was a really big rubber tube so I, I couldn't hold myself up it was oversized um, so I was um, you know, taking in a lot of water already and then good thing somebody, a stranger passed by and saw me, you know, struggling and then he, he picked me up and yeah, and I, and I couldn't remember who that guy was, uh, but that guy, that guy saved my life that day because nobody was uh, watching. Um, so anxiety and dyspnea can be a unending vicious cycle 
the more short of breath you get, the more anxious you get. And then the more anxious you get, the more short of breath you become. And then next thing you know, you're caught in that unending cycle, which you cannot get out of. So with every patient who is dysnic, never leave them alone. You can yell out if you need to go get something, just yell for, for it. Uh, tell people what to do, what you need, but or ask somebody to stay with a patient, but never leave an anxious patient alone. All right, next thing you know, they're now hysterical because again, anxiety and dyspnea can be a, a vicious cycle. So you need to stop it somehow. And then the first thing to, uh, first step to stop anxiety is to stay with a patient. Okay? Because there's nothing worse than being alone and uh, not being able to breathe. All right, so just like my experience with the rubber tube. Okay, so I felt so alone there. I can see this guy, but then, you know, there was nobody around. Uh, that was the scariest uh, event. Um, uh, it's probably why until this day, I don't know how to swim. Okay, I'm actually afraid of water. Um, okay, this is still under anxiety. These are your interventions for anxiety. Uh, I really have no other question on that. Okay, endurance, this is now your exercise, which we discussed earlier. So it's um, energy conservation as with any other dysnic patient. So this will also apply in TB and pneumonia or even patients with anemia. We saw this under pneumonia vaccination uh, are COPD patients at risk for pneumonia? Yes. Yes. Uh, what was the CDC recommendation again for patients with pneumonia or uh, COPD or diabetes, cystic fibrosis, etc.? We go review that, okay? Um, but for COPD patients, definitely they need uh, flu as well as pneumonia vaccination. And avoiding crowds is a given. They are at risk for respiratory infections easily. And we're about done now and we'll take a break. Um, this is now for discharge. Uh, again, tell the patient that this is a lifelong event. So they'll have to take care of themselves. There's no cure for COPD unless you get a new lung. Uh, so therefore, it needs lifelong management. They'll have good days, they'll have bad days. Every year, number one trigger is uh, winter. You'll have increased admissions in the winter, uh, which will keep you guys employed, you know, even though uh, surgeries are lower in the summer and in the winter as well because people don't like to be in a hospital during the winter so elective surgeries are low however you will still have a job because you have these patients getting exacerbations okay so they will keep hospitals open off season uh, the rest of these are nothing new uh, nothing there and that's that's it uh, take a break, come back at 9.40. All right, sounds good, thank you.